Boise School District finishes their first week of school here online. Within this framework, there's nothing about mandating masks within schools for students or staff. But if you needed a reason to stay inside today, it wasn't our temperature or our humidity. It was this right here, our current air quality. We're sitting at an unhealthy level. We're chanting no justice, no peace. While the student doctors are interacting with patients over here, they're actually being recorded over here. Each interaction is observed. 80% of West Ada High Schools, including Mountain View behind me, are overcrowded. They've recently started rerouting irrigation and moving pipes in this area, but they still need to move a few fences and signs before they can actually put the sidewalk in. The ruling means Edma will be the first transgender inmate in the country to receive the surgery. One of the services this dental team offers the kids is placing sealants, which means they can keep their smiles nice and healthy without missing valuable class time. Kickoff might not be until 8.15, but take a look at the fans right now. Behind me is the future home of Swan Falls High School, which is just one way the CUNA School District is hoping to get students prepared for the future. Another day of smoke and warm temperatures. It looks and feels similar to how it has the past couple of days, and this is going to be what it looks and feels like for the next few days. Our current temperature in Boise is 82 degrees, 39 percent humidity. We're lucky our high only got to 93 degrees, because had we been closer to this record high of 107, that would not have been good, given our current air quality is not where we like to see it. Right now we're sitting in this unhealthy level. Idaho Falls and Pocatello is in that unhealthy range as well. This is because of all of that smoke coming in from Northern California. Here's a look at our high temperatures today, and here's a closer look at why we're seeing all of that smoke and fire. As I showed you earlier, this is all getting pushed up from Northern California. It's reaching us here in the Treasure Valley, and it's expanding to the eastern portions of our state, as I mentioned, Idaho Falls and Pocatello. We're also going to be seeing some clouds come in on Monday, which Greg Hampikian knows DNA. He's been studying samples of it from suspects for years to assist Canyon County detectives in the Daryl Lynn Johnson case. And the folks in my lab at the time, uh, Michael Davis, uh, did mitochondrial sequencing on, on DNA from suspects that were eliminated. All of them were eliminated. The case had hair evidence, and Charles Fane was originally pinned to the crime. Hair isn't the best DNA. His lawyer was able to show the hairs didn't match, exonerating Fain, but the case was still unsolved. We're left with this problem. Whose hair is it? In 2016, Greg met scientist Ed Green, whose lab at UC Santa Cruz looks at old, broken, and degraded DNA. He introduced Ed to the detectives, and Green's new research led to this man, David Allen Dalrymple, a DNA match. Ed Green was able to develop for the police from these hairs uh, enough DNA information to know, first of all, it was a hair from a male that was very important. And second of all, to get enough information that it could be compared to some uh, genealogy. Hampikian says this is cutting edge stuff. They can look at smaller and smaller pieces to identify a mitochondrial DNA profile. Really the best of the best of the best for broken, old, dead DNA. Dalrymple's sample was not one Greg had tested in his lab, but he says for the science, this is a satisfying end to the decades-long search for justice. This is 40 years. The lesson for me is no, you never give up. Lori Walenga has to make a tough decision in the next few weeks. I just don't feel like that's a fair place to put parents to ask them to choose between their family's health and their other child's education. As a parent in West Ada School District, Lori's family has the option to attend the district's virtual program next semester. But it means her daughter Ella would lose her spot at Galileo STEM Academy, a school of choice they were thrilled to get into via a lottery system. We will fill that seat if there are kids on the waiting list. Other parents at these schools of choice are in the same position. If it's not a decision, I'm not sending them to school. Not until there's a vaccine or the end of the pandemic. There's no guarantee they'll have a spot when school returns, but the district is making some accommodations. If they are a student with an underlying health condition that puts them at risk of staying in a regular school, we will reserve them a spot. A good solution, but it certainly doesn't account for families like the Walangas. Ella herself does not have any medical conditions on her own, but her brother does. And sending her to a school 
school of between 800 and 1,000 people, her chance of exposure is off the chart. Parents are hoping to see other possible solutions implemented. In, in a perfect world, I would like to see the kids be able to stay in their schools of choice and participate virtually. And put the STEM skills they're learning in their classrooms to use. We have a pandemic, a national pandemic, that's affecting our state in skyrocketing numbers. We have an actual real life problem here, so let's use our STEM education to solve that problem. The district says they plan to ask the board to waive a policy which would allow them to put the students who don't return in person to their schools of choice first in next year's lottery. The family tells me missing one dialysis treatment is like missing a week of your kidney function. And Donna Forrester had to miss two separate appointments after her Medicaid rides canceled. It's not a high percentage of canceled rides, but just one can turn into a life or death situation. The only reason why I filled out the, the Medicaid paperwork was to see if she could qualify for transportation. Mandy Forrester works two full-time jobs, one as a pharmacist and one as an advocate and caretaker for her mother, Donna. She's my nurse. She takes care of all my medicines and all my knees and, and stuff like that. And uh, I, I'd be lost. Donna has type 2 diabetes and found herself in renal failure last November. Mandy relies on Medicaid's transportation service to get Donna to her much needed four hour long dialysis treatments three times a week, except it hasn't always been reliable. She received a, a text message saying that her ride had been canceled and then she had received a phone call saying that her dialysis treatment had been canceled. Oh, yeah. I called the dialysis center and I asked them, what, was her treatment canceled today? No, we were waiting for her. The driver had called the dialysis center to, I guess, confirm the appointment, but he had the wrong center. It wasn't an isolated incident. The second time that it was canceled, she had received a text message saying that your ride has been canceled um, by MTM and we are arranging for a Lyft driver. And their assigned Lyft driver promptly canceled too. It's very frustrating. I figured if this is happening to her, it's happening to other people who need life-saving treatments. And it is. The number of missed trips is running right around 0.07%. In total, it's around 1,129 missed trips for the year. Donna was one of the 88 who filed a complaint of a missed trip in November. In, in the best case, a missed trip is going to be an inconvenience for someone. Anywhere from that to, you know, they might have something that's a lot more important that really could represent a risk to their health. Luckily for the foresters, once the Department of Health and Welfare heard about the situation, they reconciled it. Now Mandy is advocating for others. Medicaid's going to offer this service. They need to make sure that it's a service that they can offer to all communities, whether it be Emmett, Paya, Weezer.